so hi everybody thank you so much for joining uh we're super excited to have you here and for taking the time to come uh and hear a little bit about firebolt uh, i hope that by the end of this you'll be as excited about firebolt as we are uh but also that we'll have most of your questions uh answered so let's get started uh so firebolt we're a new entrant to this exciting space uh we emerged out of stealth pretty recently uh, after having built the product in stealth for uh, sort of in the last uh, two years or so. Uh, and, and we came into this market really to shake things up. So we uh, primarily target companies that are very mature in their both cloud DNA and data engineering DNA, so to say. So uh, companies that typically have either been in the cloud for a very long time or have been born into the cloud and typically already have analytic stacks in the cloud, but also have big data challenges and a, a advanced data mindset. And we see ourselves in the market as starting where the modern breed of cloud data warehouses and query engines sort of end. So, you know, if you look at the middle of the slide, between Redshift, which were the first cloud data warehouse, uh, which was very uh, a very big deal to the data market, but also other technologies that, that followed, uh, like BigQuery and Athena and others not on this list, and of course Snowflake with their super impressive IPO. Uh, so on the one hand, there's no doubt that the market has seen amazing progress in the last five to seven years or so, and you know so many companies have already or are still are transitioning from the traditional on-prem warehousing days to one of the more modern vendors. But also we all know that, you know, if you're in the cloud and you have a lot of data, just being on one of these newer technologies is not uh, an answer to all of our problems, mostly because in recent years, uh, the pace in which data grew outpaced, you know, what these technologies uh, gave us. And we came into this market um, with the idea that we can deliver a product that can handle more data much faster than the others while keeping things super simple to use and, and very cost effective. And we'll spend some time talking about our differentiators and I'll show you the product uh, as well to understand how they uh, work in reality. But essentially our three differentiators are, are these. First, speed. So. A very deep part of our DNA uh, comes from high performance databases. Our founder and CEO uh, has been, is a world known high performance database expert, been uh, doing crazy things like building an OLAP compiler when he was already a teenager. Uh, at his previous startup, Sisense, he built an in memory engine that is uh, amazingly fast. And he started this company uh, uh, with the idea in mind that we can leverage the latest technologies, both from uh, the market and from academia, specifically for big data environments in the cloud. Uh, and, and, you know, we mention speed almost everywhere. Typically every POC we do, we also start by proving how much faster we are compared to the others. So we'll spend some time also talking about how we do that. Uh, secondly, it's scale. So, you know, when we built our product and we looked at the available technologies out there, Redshift, BigQuery, Snowflake and such, uh, we really liked what Snowflake actually did. Uh, they deserved a lot of credit, we think, for their decoupled storage and compute architecture. And our architecture, uh, I would say, is more comparable to, to Snowflake than the others. We also decouple storage and compute. Uh, for every database, you can mix and match and spin up multiple clusters with different sizes and resize them with a click. And we believe that's the kind of elasticity uh, that the market needs and is the future for, for data platforms. And lastly, efficiency. So efficiency for us means that we're not just fast and scalable, but we can actually do that without relying on huge clusters and expensive hardware. And at the end of the day in the cloud and uh, the paper use models, that's where cost savings come from because uh, all the query engines and warehouses in the cloud essentially resell compute back to the user. And if you can do more with less hardware, that's where your cost savings come from. And that's when suddenly you can really unlock use cases that weren't cost effective uh, before that. So all of these things combined from a product strategy perspective, work together so that our customers can spend more time asking their data more questions, building out more use cases over their data, 
extracting more value out of it, spending less time configuring, tuning, uh, worrying about migrations to bigger clusters, worrying about the cost of the next query, uh, and so forth. So let's get started and talk a little bit about uh, speed and dive deeper on that subject. So just to set the stage in terms of where the market is, uh, I like to show this benchmark by Fivetran. If you Google uh, benchmark, Redshift, Snowflake, uh, et cetera, uh, typically that's the benchmark you would see as the top Google result. And, and the nice thing is that Fivetran actually uh, republished this benchmark every year. And there's a close race between Snowflake, Redshift, BigQuery, and the technologies are pretty comparable performance-wise. But the interesting part is that you can see that already from one terabyte, which is the size they use for the benchmark, queries already take eight seconds, 11 seconds. And if you look at the charts, the histogram, you see that even it takes beyond 20 seconds. So these are speeds that are suddenly not that fun anymore for interactive analytics. Uh, and it's an issue because our data volumes uh, are starting to pass these numbers uh, ever more so often. Firebolt consistently delivers sub-second performance over uh, these data volumes. And let us let me switch to the product to show you that uh, live. So uh, let's do a couple of clicks. OK, I'm in the uh, Firebolt product right now. We'll come back to, the, to it because first I want to show you this dashboard. So this is a Looker dashboard, which I'm going to use for, for the demo. It's actually built on a real uh, uh, world uh, use case from a customer of ours. They gave us their data in an obfuscated way, and, and we're allowed to, to use it. But it's an ad tech company. And essentially, they analyze uh, you know, campaigns, click-throughs, uh, devices, and a variety of things like that. And the nice thing about it is that I will click uh, clear cache and refresh here on the, on the top right so we can reload the dashboard and see how fast it is. This runs on 42 billion rows. And you see all the waiting indicators gone, which means it just refreshed. Um, and if I open the filter section, the way people work with this dashboard, typically some sort of an account manager would filter different media sources to look for the ones they're in charge of and, and play around. Uh, you know, even if I change the increase from a one-week analysis to a two-week analysis and click clear cache and refresh again, we'll see that uh, it, come back, it comes back uh, very fast over these uh, 42 billion rows. Now let's switch back to the product the, and I'll show you the query behind this particular uh, table at the bottom of the dashboard. Uh, and, and this is uh, literally the, the query here. So what we see that we have here uh, is a select statement. So we start with the from the LTV table, that's 42 billion rows. Let's real quick uh, do a select uh, count so you know I'm, I'm for real uh, from LTV. So that's 42 uh, billion rows. And there's also uh, two left joins to two other tables. Uh, a variety of fields, and then a variety of aggregations mixed with uh, case statements, etc., and a bunch of filters and group buys, etc. If I run this, uh, it comes back in 0.61 seconds, which I'd say uh, is very, very fast. And we're not talking about something that comes back from a result cache. Uh, you know, even if I go, like I showed you before, I increase it to two weeks, uh, it will be fast. Or if I do a you know, the second week of the month, uh, it will be fast. And, you know, even if I am now going to paste uh, a different media source, which is how people typically use this dashboard, um, then it will also be fast. And even if I change the, the granularity, meaning I will disable one of the group eyes, uh, I will run it and it's still fast, or let's disable even another group eye. So I'm, I'm collapsing the region and platform fields, uh, it remains fast. So I'm able to analyze 42 billion rows uh, with joins included, variety of filters and granularities, and do it amazingly fast. Uh, 
And we'll come back to, I'm going to switch back to the presentation now, but we'll come back to the, to the product to see a variety of other things that happen behind the scenes. Um, so let's go back to the presentation. Okay, now I do want to share some concepts or some you know, visibility into what we have under the hood. How come we're so fast? So I'll walk you through some of the, of the concepts. Uh, we have a big technology stack under the hood that makes us special, but roughly you could split it into two main tech categories, so to say. One deals with the storage layer. So there's, you know, in the cloud, there's what I would say a complicated relationship between the query engine and the storage layer. Well, we enjoy the infinite scale of S3, which is great. But on the other hand, it's also not the fastest storage layer to say the least. So when query engines in the cloud have something that is not in the cache and they have to scan data in S3, this is when things become slow. Uh, typically very evident in uh, things like Athena and Presto where uh, data is scanned literally uh, in, in S3 in place. So the technologies here are all about how do you optimize storage? How do you compress data? How do you index data? And how do you serve data to the higher memory tiers in an efficient way? And a different set of technologies focuses on the compute. And this is where we care about how to squeeze as much, as much juice as we can from the CPU, but particularly for analytic workloads, meaning uh, aggregations, joins, uh, group buys, and things like that. So we'll start with, with uh, an important building block uh, on the storage category, which is our own proprietary file format. We call it triple F or F3, which in itself plays a huge role in the speed up. What's unique about this file format is that when we pull data in to Firebolt from your uh, S3, essentially we convert it uh, to this file format. It's always sorted. So every table in Firebolt has a primary index defined on top of it. This primary index really defines the physical sort order of the files as they're uh, stored. The files are also compressed uh, very efficiently because of the sorting typically. And then they're also indexed. They're indexed with a type of index that in academia speak is called a sparse index. A sparse index is very good at pointing to huge data sets, but remains small in size. So you typically load it into RAM. But what's uh, its purpose in life is to do uh, data pruning. And that means that when a query comes in, the query engine can use the sparse index to know which very granular uh, ranges of data to pull from within the files that are stored on, on the S3. Essentially, we only pull the granular rows that actually participate in the query. Uh, and, and this saves a lot of bandwidth, a lot of movement of data that is not necessary from the slowest memory storage tier. Uh, so just for comparison, most query engines in the cloud, what they do is they move bigger chunks of data higher up, and then these get sliced. So for example, in Snowflake, the, slow, the smallest piece of data that can move is a micro partition, which is uh, between 50 and 150 megabytes in size, and then it gets sliced. sliced. The way we work with indexes in a tightly coupled way to the storage format really increases the efficiency of pruning and helps us save IO. And that's one building block that's important. On top of that, there's a variety of sort of CPU oriented technologies. So for example, we have a very sophisticated optimizer. Uh, this optimizer, uh, what it does is it replaces human written SQL or BI tool generated SQL with optimized SQL that is much faster. So we typically you know, are very good at surviving what I would say call sort of ugly SQL. Uh, we don't force you to rewrite it in an optimal way. Essentially, we do that behind the scenes. Uh, it turns out that it works actually very well with uh, Tableau, if you're a Tableau users. From all the BI tools, it's fair to say that Tableau generates the most complex and hard to decipher uh, 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 SQL. And that's why you also see most of the warehouses not working well in a live format with Tableau and people keep using extracts, Tableau extracts, uh, the in-memory of Tableau essentially when they work over a warehouse. But we encourage using of, of live Tableau uh, in uh, Firebolt and pride ourselves in, in delivering the fastest experience there. Uh, we also do vectorized processing, which is all about how to maximum the throughput at the CPU level. 
So that comes from the world of columnar databases and uh, how, how we leverage the uh, different CPU cache levels and how we serve data to the CPU in a, a factor form uh, approach, not a row by row approach. And just in time compilation also kicks in. So all of these things combined really is uh, what gives Firebolt that edge. We like to say that we definitely have the most modern uh, tech stack in both optimizing for storage and for CPU uh, in, in the current market. Uh, so when you work with Firebolt, you feel the performance gain uh, pretty early on. And, and this is sort of what you saw uh, when I showed you the queries running live in the product. Uh, and while the things we discussed in this slide uh, are things that the user doesn't really have to manage or care about, we also provide a few sort of techniques or tools that are in our users' hands to optimize further. And these typically come in the form of indexes. One example is this type of index. We call it an aggregating index. This is a, a tool that is extremely useful for workloads where you do know in advance which dimensions and measures uh, or kind of queries people will be mostly using. So particularly useful for dashboards and reports and BI tools. And in that case, what you can do is you define uh, an aggregating index on a table, uh, and you can define multiple such indexes over the same table. And within it, you define the fields, the dimensions, and the aggregations that it should index. Uh, and then when a query comes in uh, and queries the, the, the table, the original table, uh, the query engine knows to identify if that table is covered by an index and if the particulars of the query are covered by it. And if it is, it leverages the index. And then two great things happen. First, the query becomes even faster. So I like to say from fast to extremely fast, so typically sub-second. But also, the query becomes very CPU light. And you can typically reduce your cluster sizes even further because index queries are really less hungry for CPU, so you can handle larger concurrency and, and use smaller clusters while still enjoying amazing performance. Another type of index we do have is an index called a join index. A join index is particularly useful uh, for joins. So we, very, we would never tell you to you know, denormalize to get better performance, um, something you typically see uh, uh, in Druid, which is a very fast data warehouse, but doesn't support joins, so users have to denormalize. Uh, so we love joins as well. Now let's quickly look. Let's quickly look at the architecture uh, and start a discussion about scale. Uh, now that we've covered, uh, you know, speed. Uh, this is our architecture from a sort of bird's eye view. You can notice the compute layer in the middle and the storage layer at the bottom, which are decoupled. We persist our databases in that triple format to S3. And the indexes are also persisted there. And in the Firebolt terminology, a compute resource, a cluster, it, we call it a Firebolt engine, which you can see in the compute layer. So for each database, you can spin up multiple such engines. Each engine can have different configuration, different size, can be shared with different users, can start and stop at different times. But multiple engines will always work on the same copy of the data. Uh, a very typical setup to start with is having one engine for ingesting of data and another for querying of data. Uh, and these engines don't, compute, don't compete with each other over resources. So the ingestion engine will be more optimized to do a good job at moving data, while the querying engine can have a different setup and configuration and be better suited for, for querying. Uh, we're also fully uh, ANSI SQL compatible, and you can see uh, at the top the a variety of clients that send their SQL to Firebolt. Uh, we're pure, purely SaaS. Uh, there's a REST API you can use, JDBC, or connect your BI tools directly, uh, and so forth. Now, let's move back to the product to show you a little bit more about that elasticity uh, through how it looks in the product. Here we go. Um, so, if I click here uh, at a database page, you can see that the database I showed you before is called AdTech DB V3 here at the bottom. It has multiple engines attached to it. Different kinds of compute resources that I can use for various purposes uh, or at different times or for different uh, use cases and share with different people. When I create a new database, uh, then essentially what happens is 
you can assign right from the start multiple uh, engines to it. So out of the box, we suggest a couple, but you can change everything. So here on the right, you can see how you configure an engine in Firebolt. Uh, here on the right, we have a slider that determines the scale of the engine. Uh, the scale of the engine essentially is how many nodes participate in the cluster, how many EC, EC2 nodes. Uh, another thing that's very unique to Firebolt is that we give you more control. So because we deal with data savvy uh, customers, uh, we believe that uh, more control is needed. Uh, then we're the only vendor that literally also lets you play around with the kind of EC2 instances under the hood. So we let you choose from a family of uh, engines that are optimized for compute. They typically have more CPUs and are good for uh, high frequency querying versus optimized for storage, more SSD. This is typically very good for uh, ingesting of data or optimized for RAM uh, or just a balanced type of machine, which is sort of cost effective and, and does well across all categories. Uh, the reason, another reason that's very important as well to have that level of choice is that oftentimes just increasing the cluster size is not the best way to improve performance. Every query uh, stops enjoying distribution at some point. Uh, oftentimes, just doubling the amount of RAM, for example, or SSD has a very significant effect of on performance. So you could go from 60 gigabyte RAM to 122, for example, and increase performance dramatically and with a better sort of, uh, with better cost efficiency compared to just doubling or increasing the cluster size. Uh, we also support a uh, spot instances so you can enjoy further cost savings um, and, and a variety of other things. So adding multiple engines, I can add as many as I want and configure each one differently uh, for a variety of purposes uh, and, and you know choose my default engine uh, and so forth. And then when I use the platform, the nice thing about the decoupled storage and compute architecture is that you know this is the query we, we just ran, which took uh, 0.25 seconds, but I can dynamically say, hey, I want to now run it on a different engine. Uh, so now it's a, a little bit supposed to be a, a faster engine. And yes, we've improved uh, it a little bit. But typically the way it's used is that, you know, you might be an analyst or have an analyst that is building out a new use case. And then you start writing your first SQLs. Uh, and that is typically an iterative process, right? Until you get the, the query right and you do some exploration. At that point in time, when you're beginning, why use your biggest and most expensive cluster? I might start with a small cluster and cheap cluster and just look at the last two weeks of data, for example. And as I get confidence with my queries and say, okay, they seem correct now, I want to now test them on you know, six months of data, then you can do a couple of clicks and move to a bigger cluster that can faster, in a fast way, deliver uh, answers over a bigger data volume. Uh, so you have a lot of control over how much you spend at any given point in time. Um, let's go uh, back to the presentation for a second. Okay, yeah, so. Okay, here we are back uh, in the deck. Uh, skipping this, we saw this. Okay, now I wanted to talk about uh, semi-structured data, which is also something we do extremely well. Uh, so semi-structured data, you know, uh, I assume some of you are already dealing with it. Uh, if not today, then definitely soon, because uh, the volumes of semi-structured are ever increasing. Uh, and semi-structured has traditionally been a challenge for analytics because, you know, we are, the market has been relational at its core for, for decades. So the typical approaches of dealing with semi-structured in the analytics flow is either do ETL in advance to flatten the data. And the challenge there is that flattening nested data makes it grow big in, in size, then there's the challenge of how to analyze data that's so big. Uh, modern solutions, for example, BigQuery and Snowflake as well, let you ingest JSON as is into the warehouse. And then in runtime of the query, you can uh, do a flatten or unnest kind of operation. Uh, and then the side effect is that, again, you're, you're unnesting, which makes data grow bigger, but this time in memory, uh, and not uh, early on. Uh, so it's typically very memory hungry and you can analyze smaller volumes of data or suffer from slower performance. 
Here, what we do at Firebolt, first, we also let you ingest JSON. We behind the scenes store it in a very efficient uh, nested array structure. We also let you flatten it in runtime, but we also very uniquely expose a, a, a Lambda-like syntax, very much like what you'd see in Presto or Athena. Uh, and that allows you to work very in a very flexible and efficient way over uh, the nested uh, data and pull out uh, the right values while enjoying the Firebolt performance uh, at scale. So that's also something we, we often show in, in our POCs. Now, we talked about, you know, uh, speed and scale and also structured data. And now let's go, you know, back to the efficiency part of, of the story. So at the end of the day, Firebolt does introduce huge cost savings. And the way we think about it is, is it's not because Firebolt is cheap or cheaper. It's because Firebolt relies on technology that is just less hungry for hardware. Uh, and this is where efficiency and cost savings come from in the cloud. Uh, and, you know, another thing about our, our pricing model in general, uh, which is important to highlight, is that we're very transparent. So always in the user interface, you will see how much you're paying per hour for the compute resource you, you, you'll be choosing. Uh, and we have a very easy pay-as-you-go model. Essentially, you pay for the compute that's up. When it stops, you don't pay. There's no commitment. Uh, uh, our goal is life is to help you succeed with our platform and you know be hungry for more and more analytics. And that's how we can uh, succeed and, and make our profit. Uh, but we also, you know, you know, let you save on compute through spot instances and, and things like that. But at the core, it really comes from uh, modern technology that, that can do more with less hardware. Uh, for example, I want to show you uh, how we typically do POCs and how we typically present results of POCs to our, to our prospects. Uh, the way we conduct POCs is we, we tell you, give us access to a bucket of data in S3. The more data, the merrier, because we want to emulate as much uh, uh, as we can, something that's close to the real world. And give us a few examples of queries that you're currently running or expect to run. And tell us you know, how much time they take to run today, and typically sort of if available, what kind of hardware they're running on. And then we do we bring in our solution architect, and we tell, typically tell you, give us a week. Uh, and, and we then implement the queries in Firebolt. We put the right indexes in place, which is the best sort of hardware combination. Um, and we come back and show you the results. Uh, and this is a, a real example we did sort of uh, three and a half weeks ago. Uh, and what you see here first, the queries are dramatically faster. But not only that, they're also run on much cheaper hardware. So we're able to do uh, $1.54 an hour compared to $16 per hour. Uh, that's huge. Uh, so not only do you get better performance, a better experience for your dashboards, for your reports, for your ad hoc analytics or, uh, or whatnot, but you can suddenly do much more. You can analyze bigger windows of data. You can suddenly uh, you know, release features for customer facing use cases that maybe you, you weren't happy before with the performance. Um, uh, and so forth. So um, a question that kept repeating itself is whether we're going to get the recording. So yes, if you signed up for Firebolt, uh, for the webinar, you will get the recording. Um, a question from Derek. Uh, is Firebolt fully ANSI SQL compliant, Boaz? Uh, yes, we're ANSI SQL compliant. We uh, speak a Postgres kind of dialect. Uh, and we have a JDBC driver that makes it easy to send your variety of SQL queries, uh, whether from BI tools or from just your code editors directly to Firebolt. Okay. Uh, is there a trial environment I can access? Sanjay is asking. So at this point, we don't have a free self-service trial environment for everybody to use. Uh, with our sort of re relatively initial go-to-market journey, uh, we're not there yet. Definitely something that will be available uh, in the future. At this point, we're also a bit more selective with who we work with in the sense that we try to see, uh, find companies that uh, do have sort of a modern data challenge and big data challenges. And, and, and then we are more than happy to do POC together. So reach out to us and, and we'll sort of schedule a call and, and, and dive deeper into your use case and show you how it's done. And then let you play, of course, with product uh, yourselves. Okay. Uh, Devin's asking if we run on GCP. Uh, so at this point, we're AWS only. 
uh, uh, probably it will stay like that for uh, you know in 2021. Uh, but in the long term, of course, uh, it would be natural to expand to other clouds. But at the beginning of our journey, again, it's AWS only. Okay. Uh, look, there's plenty of other questions. So feel free to, to have a look. Um... Um, there's a question of how long it takes to import one terabyte of data. Uh, so the nice thing about decoupled storage and compute and the elasticity, which I showed you before, we can move a slider to determine how many nodes participate in the, in the slider. It really means that you can control how long it will take. Uh, the, the speed in which you insert data uh, is linearly improving with uh, the number of nodes in the engine because moving of data is very easy to parallelize. You just uh, add more nodes and every node adds a different chunk. Uh, so you can add a terabyte you know, easily you know, in 15 minutes uh, or in 30 minutes if you use half of the nodes. Uh, so the data transfer is, is very fast. Typically, uh, you know, if you're, the way you're set up is to move a lot of data, maybe on a nightly basis, then you use a stronger engine. But then after you do the bulk of the movements, oftentimes people go into sort of incremental movement of data, uh, you know, every hour or every 10 minutes or so. And then you need a very small engine because there's always just little data to move. Um, people, people are asking about aggregated indexes and how similar they are to materialized views. I know this is something you're passionate about. Uh, Yes, so materialist views is a well-known concept uh, in our immediate spaces. So Snowflake also, that's a methodology for them. I like to talk, uh, what we like to say at Firebolt is an aggregating index is what you always wanted the materialist view to be, but it never was. Uh, so it's much easier to manage. Uh, essentially, you don't have to point your queries to the materialist view. You keep pointing them to the table. Our query engine knows how to you know, make sure the indexes are, are, are applied behind the scenes. And also every type of aggregation slash measure is supported, uh, not just a subset. And in Firebolt, essentially, you never have to manage it. You never rematerialize or anything. Even when you resize the clusters or uh, stop and start, essentially, you define them once over the table, and, and that's it. Uh, and the overhead uh, in terms of compute to create them and storage to store them is very, very marginal. That's why we actually encourage uh, a lot of usage because the benefit is typically dramatic, both in performance and in the ability to, to reduce the cluster size. So the same person actually asked also about joint indexes and mentioned you barely touched on that. So, yeah, so boy, joint please, indexes, please elaborate. So interestingly, by the way, so indexes in general are also part of our continuous roadmap. So I mentioned aggregating indexes and joint indexes, which are sort of our core type of indexes next to the sparse index, which is more in the storage layer. But uh, for example, we're going to have a hash index coming up and a, uh, an index is specifically for textures coming up. So this, we're always looking for more opportunities to uh, build in more uh, index types. And also important to mention is that, yes, today these indexes are defined manually, but part of our vision and our story is all about these becoming automated. Essentially, uh, soon enough, you will get recommendations saying to you, hey, we noticed that there's a workload that could really benefit from this index, which you haven't created. Click here, one click to create it, uh, and so forth to help you save uh, costs on compute uh, and be more efficient in the way you work. Join indexes is something that you define, uh, you know, typically between the fact table and uh, this, the big fact table and the smaller dimension tables. Uh, typically, it's something that's loaded into RUM. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, there's a technical explanation of how in detail it would work, but I think it's a bit uh, too complicated to go into uh, at this point. But it does accelerate joins dramatically uh, uh, while you just, you know, keep using your regular join syntax. Uh, there's a question about the AWS marketplace and SaaS and so forth. So Firebolt, uh, the only way to you to you know, purchase it is through the AWS marketplace, uh, and uh, data does leave your VPC. So uh, that was a question. It's important to answer in that regard. Yeah, another sort of uh, good comparison would be the kind of architecture Snowflake has. Uh, we're pretty much enjoying the fact that Snowflake, to some extent educated the market that it's okay uh, to move your data outside your VPC. Of course, once it's in our VPC, you know, we manage it for you and every client has isolation in terms of the S3 bucket and the EC2 instances. So there's no really sharing of resources between customers, but the data doesn't move uh, to us. Uh, 
uh, and we're 100% SaaS, so you cannot install it sort of in your VPC uh, and so forth. Um, what else? Uh, what another else? question was about another question was about controlling, you know, who can use which compute resources uh, and so forth. So yes, so you know, for example, you can have a compute resource that's good for you know production, don't touch, and you know only two people have access to it, or you can have people. You know, some people are responsible for the ingestion engine, which are not the same people who are, uh, can use sort of the querying uh, type of engines. Uh, and that's an important uh, sort of aspect of working with multiple engines over one database. Um, <laughs> There's so uh, many. Stuff, <laughs> There's so many. Uh, Do you want to select the last yeah. one? And uh, yeah, we'll get yeah. the rest of the line. I think about aggregate indexes. Uh, there is a, a question on you know, the speed comparison of aggregated indexes versus micro partitions. So it's not like apples to apples. So a micro partition would be sort of the, the parallel to our triple F format, whereas the aggregating index would be the more the parallel to, uh, to Snowflake's materialized view, so to say. But all in all, you know, day in, day out, we, it's very easy to us to show performance gain and price performance gain over Redshift, BigQuery, uh, Snowflake, that's sort of the, uh, and also Athena, Presto. That's what we typically do day in, day out. Uh, so if you have a workload where, you know, you're feeling you're, it's too slow or not cost-effective enough or you're trying to do more, uh, it's starting to choke and become challenging, reach out to us and we'll just uh, show you. Uh, Okay, let's wrap so it thank up. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Boaz. Thank you, everyone, for taking part. Uh, we will be in touch with whoever asked more questions. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for more. Follow us on LinkedIn. Um, and if you want to uh, learn more about uh, what's coming, and uh, it's going to be exciting. So have a good one. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.